Hi everyone, my name is Emma and along with Krish, we'll be presenting the Harker School's 2023 CIF project on bringing intersectional approaches to youth education for nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation. So to start off, we'll be talking a bit about the current nuclear weapons situation and why nuclear weapons are still a pressing issue today. Well, first of all, there are nine nuclear armed countries, including Russia, the US and China, and together they possess a total of about 13,000 nuclear weapons. And as of right now, none of these countries have joined the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which is a legally binding international agreement that would prohibit all sorts of nuclear activities. So none of these countries have yet joined this treaty. And moreover, there are five additional states that host nuclear weapons with 29 more endorsing their possession. And combined with current events, all these factors point to how nuclear weapons are still an imminent threat and will continue to be for years to come. And that is why we as youth play such an important role. And speaking of youth, next we're going to talk about the history of edu educational approaches and how youth have been taught about nuclear weapons. So we've identified a few ways in which youth are traditionally taught about nuclear weapons. And of course, the most common method is incorporation into a social studies or history class that teaches about the role of nuclear weapons in world history. So when, where, how they were used. And to a smaller degree, there are nonprofits and volunteer organizations out there that host speaker events and workshops that teach youth about nuclear weapons. But again, most of mostly students will learn about nuclear weapons through their history class. So of course, the next question we're going to address is why we think these traditional approaches are insufficient. Well, for one, it's difficult for students to obtain, to absorb lots of historical information in a classroom setting, especially since a lesson about nuclear weapons will take a few hours at most, which really doesn't promote a lasting understanding of these concepts. And second of all, there are no methods that target specific age groups. So for example, high school students versus middle school students. And with a really complex and heavy topic like nuclear weapons, we believe that it would really benefit from different supplemental learning methods for each age group. And third of all, there's a lack of focus and context about the current nuclear weapons situation, because again, it's usually um, confined to a historical knowledge and a historical setting which doesn't really promote students really understanding the role of nuclear weapons today and why it's still an issue. So these are all shortcomings that we hope our proposed approaches will address. And now Emruta will introduce our ideas for new pedagogical approaches. Okay, so let's go over our ideas, the new pedagogical approaches that we want to implement. So we're choosing an intersectional approach, which is a method of education that combines different mediums to maximize the interactivity between um, students and the material they're learning between each other. So we believe that interaction is the key to learning because this allows students to have an agent to have agency or choice in the learning process, which means that they feel more involved or included, and that means they want to participate and learn more rather than just being forced to learn the information. And communicating with other people expands our worldview and helps us rework and organize our ideas. And lastly, it adds another dimension to the material, material that enhances the understanding or provides a new perspective. So first we thought to incorporate some sort of audio element as that method of interactivity. And that's why we came up with the idea of podcasts. So why are podcasts an appealing option? So for one, they're very popular right now. And that popularity is only growing. So currently there's hundreds of millions of podcast listeners across the globe. And that number is only projected to grow to about half a billion by the end of next year. And another big plus about podcasts is that they're extremely accessible. So you can listen to them anywhere, anytime when you're, you know, in the car or doing whatever, you can just put them on the background. And that's why they're very appealing to a lot of people. Another aspect of that accessibility is that there are a lot of platforms right now that support podcasts. So Apple Podcasts or Spotify or web browser, there's a lot of methods to access podcasts. 
And finally, the very nature of podcasts that organizes a lot of these audio bits, whether it's interviews with people or discussions among a group or pieces of content, the podcast, you know, compresses and organizes all these pieces of information and then puts it out in a format that is really easy to follow. And then another big aspect of podcasts is that they have very high engagement value. The very inclusion of real people's voices adds a very personal dimension to the content, which makes it more engaging to listen to. And the fact that, like I said, it organizes a lot of these different pieces of information together in a compelling narrative structure that allows people to follow it easily, and it's really exciting to listen to. So specifically, what is our idea for a podcast? Well, our vision is that students from across the globe will record their own ideas on these following topics, all related to nuclear weapons, and somehow share them in a public forum. So each student group around the world will record their own episode, in, in essence, and then put them onto the public forum so that students from other places can also hear their ideas. So the first topic we would like for people to address would be just the basics, right? The general education of how they've been taught about nuclear weapons and what are their thoughts on how that education went. So what did they think about the thoroughness or extent of that education? And then next, we would like to go into some more personal aspects about the area that they're from and the environment that they're in. So what are their peers or town's general attitude towards nuclear weapons and the involvement of other nations in nuclear weapons. So that goes under perception. And then third, we like them to talk a bit about the media coverage of nuclear weapons in their, in their environment or their town. What is the general attitude that media platforms like newspapers or broadcasts, what is the general attitude that they convey about nuclear weapons and their role in geopolitical conflicts? And then finally, the most personal and important question would just be asking the students themselves, what are their visions for the future and the future of nuclear weapons? So what are we hoping to accomplish with this idea and with these topics? Well, for one, we hope that through the very act of gathering their peers or their friends together to discuss these topics, we hope that students can reflect on their own education and beliefs about nuclear weapons. And then second, through the act of putting each of these individual episodes onto some sort of public forum or stringing them together into a podcast series and allowing students from across the world to listen to these ideas, we hope that this will promote empathy between different nations and cultures, which will lead to understanding of different perspectives and obstacles in the pursuit of nuclear disarmament. Because since nuclear disarmament is a global effort that requires global coordination, as youth, we can make a really important first step by just understanding where we're at um, in terms of nuclear education, in terms of our towns, our surrounding environments, perception of nuclear weapons, and of course, our own ideas about the future of nuclear weapons. And just hearing people's ideas from around the globe will form a really good foundation in terms of pursuing this goal of nuclear disarmament. So another strategy that can be used as an intersectional approach for learning is games. So games can come in a few different formats. There are strategy games that are really focused on teaching students how to think ahead and find complex solutions to uh, problems. There's also educational games, which really focus on reinforcing the concepts and um, in, through an engaging format, sparking this sense of curiosity and experiential learning. Um, so beyond that, though, games are also essential for uh, creating the sense of community in a very interactive environment. Uh, so regardless of your age uh, your, or your ethnicity, um, you're really able to connect with people online and build that strong community, um, whether the topic is nuclear weapons um, or climate change or really any sort of global issue. Uh, these educational games can be central to creating a like-minded community and a group of peers. So in order to understand what new type of game we could add um, in schools and provide this more engaging format of learning, um, we decided to look at what games existed 
and, and what have been developed so far. So in terms of nuclear energy, there are a few games. The first is a nuclear reactor simulation um, where students will learn how to operate a nuclear reactor. Uh, the second is a nuclear fission or chain reaction simulation where students learn the technical details behind how to start a chain reaction and the energy production in a nuclear reactor um, and just understanding the details behind that. Um, and then also the third is the nuclear fusion simulation where students um, through an engaging format um, and like a drag and drop environment would understand how you would specifically activate a fusion reactor. Um, aside from nuclear energy, there's also games that have been focused on simulating the uh, the consequences of a certain war. Um, so the Plan A game developed by Princeton looks at different consequences associated with a type of nuclear war. So you can input parameters on like the different powers involved or uh, the the degree of conflict or, or um, tension between the two powers and accordingly determine the consequences that would be produced from that conflict. And then finally, there have been some games that are focused specifically on the experience of nuclear attack. Uh, these tend to be a bit more kiddish and make more light of the uh, of the conflict um, than should be done. But uh, these VR games, such as one developed by Princeton, um, sometimes provide a, an experience of like what a false alert would look like um, or what an actual nuclear war would look like in terms of all the powers involved. Um, and this is pretty essential for someone who's quite young and is just new to the whole idea of what a nuclear conflict would look like. Um, and yeah. So in terms of what we propose, um, there haven't been too many games focused on really the consequences or how how one would go about um, approaching a post-nuclear world. Um, and I think a game centered around this topic would really allow students to understand the gravity and the, the severity of what nuclear war means and what people will have to go through if something like that exists. And I think through a game, one will really understand the importance of trying to stop something like a nuclear war from happening. Um, so there's really two approaches or two angles you can look at this. You can look at it from um, ahead of uh, like before nuclear winter. Um, and this is really similar to some of the games that I already listed uh, that Princeton has developed um, in terms of just like how many bronze bombs have been dropped, um, how dangerous is the zone. And, and it is kind of like in a very uh, gimmicky slash like game mindset of, of how to approach that. Um, but the newer idea that we're focusing on is uh, during a nuclear winter. So after that war has been done um, and there's been a huge explosion, there's a lot of uh, rippling effects on the climate and, and food supply and, and and just many different parts and water sanity and different things like that. Um, the students will have to try to find a way to uh, really like a survival game and figure out like what the best approach is to uh, come back from that or whether it's like finding a shelter, looking for appropriate food, um, creating a sense of community, uh, reviving the economy. And I think all these questions would really allow uh, students to understand how detrimental such a nuclear incident could be on the world. Um, and really put them in the shoes of someone who would have to undergo and and um, and really approach that kind of incident. So yeah, that is what our idea looks like. And thank you for listening. We hope we provided some insight through the podcast and the games and, and other things of what an intersectional approach to uh, nuclear education would look like.